Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Hope you're having a beautiful Sabbath day, and I'd also like to wish a happy Sabbath to those that are on the webcast as well. It's a beautiful day outside, and we really can't complain too much about winter so far. And I know I shouldn't say that because then it would probably get bad, but I really do hope you're having a wonderful and encouraging Sabbath, brethren. But I'd like to begin today in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. We'll read a scripture that some use a certain way, which we'll talk about in just a minute. This is Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Paul writes to the Romans, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Just a short ways away from this in Romans chapter 7, verse 6. Paul writes, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So it seems that Paul is saying that we are no longer under the law, and that we've been delivered from it. And notice what he says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul writes to the Galatians, he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Well, these scriptures are used by many to say that the law was a curse to mankind and that mankind needed to be redeemed or delivered from it by Jesus Christ. And as this thinking goes, Jesus did this by his sacrifice, and now we are no longer under or subject to the law of God. But is this what Paul was actually saying? Let's look at John chapter 13, verse 34. And read a statement that Jesus Christ himself said in John chapter 13, verse 34. Thank you for the Snickers bar. I don't think I'll be eating it. It's not on my diet, but thank you anyway. <laughs> I can re-gift it, <laughs> but thank you. Um, John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So Jesus says he's giving a new commandment, that we love one another. And some use this statement of Jesus to say that he replaced the Old Testament law of God with a new law. This concept is then used to make the argument that Jesus changed the law keeping some of the law and discarding other elements of the law, especially the fourth commandment involving the weekly Sabbath and by extension, the annual holy days, first given in the Old Testament along with other aspects of the law, including clean and unclean meats. This statement by Jesus here in John 13, along with other scriptures and the writings of Paul are used to make the argument that the Old Testament law was harsh and that Jesus changed it as part of the new covenant. But is this true? Is it true? What is the truth about God's law in the new covenant? Brethren, there's a powerful deception that is coming in the not too distant future, I believe. A deception that will be so powerful that even those who have been called by God could be deceived by this deception. It will be powerful. And it will undoubtedly include powerful deception concerning the law of God. We need to be firmly rooted in our understanding and conviction of the truth concerning the law of God. So today in this message, we will examine the critical subject of the law of God in light of the new covenant 
as God reveals it in his word, the Holy Bible. And I've entitled this message, The Truth About the Law of God. The Truth About the Law of God. In our UCG booklet, The New Covenant, Does It Abolish God's Law? Which is a fantastic book, or booklet, was a prime source of my material today, along with some of my own study and prayer and meditation. <coughs> So let's consider this subject about the law of God. Let's begin by looking about at what Jesus himself said, said about what Jesus himself said about the law of God. Let's look in Matthew chapter 5 and we'll start in verse 17. And this is an account of a famous sermon that Jesus gave, the Sermon on the Mount. And he talks about the law of God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, why would Jesus say at the beginning of this verse, don't think that I came to destroy the law? It is because many people at that time thought that Jesus was against the law because his teaching was so different from, than the teachings about the law from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember my, lessons, my message last year on the Sabbath, which we looked at how the Pharisees and Sadducees taught and practiced many things that had been added to the law, such as onerous and silly regulations concerning the Sabbath that, that made the Sabbath a heavy burden to the people. And Jesus called out the Pharisees and Sadducees on these man-made additions to the law. So many thought that Jesus sought to annul the law and substitute his own law in its place. This is why Jesus states directly in Matthew 5, 17, his intent was not to destroy the law. And to be clear, what was the law Jesus was referring to in this statement. It is the law of Moses, or the Torah, given in the first five books of the Bible. And he mentions the prophets, which means the Old Testament scriptures. So Jesus directly states that his intent is not to destroy the law of Moses and subvert the Old Testament scriptures. And what does he say next in Matthew 5 or 17, he says, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What does Jesus mean by fulfill the law? It is important that we understand what he meant. And the understanding of it, brethren, is beautiful. It's beautiful. This is where many today twist this to mean that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law so that we no longer have to keep it. Another view of this verse in Matthew 5, 17 is that Jesus fulfilled what was lacking in the law, meaning that he finished it by keeping some of it, discarding other parts of it, and adding new parts to the law. And then this new law, according to this thinking, is called Christ's law, or the New Testament law, by proponents of this view. And the implications are that the New Testament brings a change to the requirements of salvation and the law as given in the Old Testament is obsolete. But are either of these two uh, views correct? Let's look again at Matthew 5.17. The Greek word that is translated as fulfill is pleru, P-L-E-R-O-O. And it means to fill to make fill, to make full, to fill to the full, or to complete, to complete. In other words, Jesus said he came to complete the law. He came to complete the law. And how did Jesus do this? How did he do it? He did it by showing the spiritual intent and application of the law. By showing the spiritual intent in the application of the law. And he gives an example right here in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 27, 
He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus gives an example in the, his message, his sermon, of the spiritual intent and application of the law. This is what he means by completing it. This is at least a large portion of what he means. By expanding and amplifying the law, by revealing its deep spiritual elements. And by Jesus doing this, he actually fulfilled a prophecy. Notice, keep your place here in Matthew chapter 5 if you have a bookmark. And turn with me to Isaiah chapter 42 verse 21. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 21. Isaiah was inspired by God's Holy Spirit to write the following words. He says, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake, referring to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. Well, the Hebrew word that's translated here in Isaiah 42, 21 for exalt is gadal. G-A-D-A-L, and it means to be or to become great. So Jesus exalted the law by showing the holy spiritual purpose and intent of the law through his many teachings, as well as how he lived his life. He obeyed the law in the way he lived his life. He met the requirements of the law. He was perfect in keeping the law. And no one has ever done that. Only Jesus Christ. He's the only one to ever do this. To perfectly keep the law of God. So these other views that we saw earlier that Jesus ended the law or he rewrote it are clever deceptions. They're clever deceptions that can appear to be right but they are very wrong because they ultimately lead to the breaking of the law, which is sin. But besides completing the law by bringing in the spiritual elements, there are actually other important ways that Jesus fulfilled the law in addition to that. And that's critically important, the spiritual elements. But the law requires perfect obedience I have not perfectly kept the law. You have not. No one has ever perfectly kept the law. And the penalty for that is death. It is death. It is to cease to exist. That's the penalty for breaking the law. This penalty is the curse of the law. Is what happens when you break it. To lose your existence. But notice, brethren, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. This is a very, very beautiful verse in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. There's a lot of truth in this verse. Let's just read the first part. Paul says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin or breaking the law is death. But then notice what he says next. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus also fulfilled the law in the sense that he paid the penalty of death for all mankind that would repent, that would truly repent, and would change. He paid that penalty or the curse of the law for us because he never sinned in his life. His sacrifice of death paid the death penalty for those who believe in him in faith. And they repent of their sins and believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins and paid the penalty. Did you believe that in your heart and you truly repent? 
So Jesus fulfilled the penalty of the law for all mankind. This is another way that he fulfilled the law. He re fulfilled the requirement of the law of those that break it. And this brings us to an important truth, brethren. The law of Moses contained several kinds of laws. In addition to the moral laws, the Ten Commandments, the law also contained various sacrifices for sins. But these sacrifices could not remove the death penalty for sin. Let's notice in Hebrews chapter 10. We'll read verses 1 through 6 and 10 through 14. In Hebrews chapter 10, Paul talks to the Hebrews about this directly, about the sacrifices and about Jesus Christ. This is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. We'll, we'll begin in verse 1. He says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those approach perfect. He's talking about the sacrifices in the law, the animal sacrifices. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Then he says, therefore, when he, referring to Jesus, came into the world, he said, and this is from Psalm 40, sacrifice and offering." you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Notice what he says, continuing in verse 10. He said, by that will we have been sanctified or set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, sacrifices which could never take away sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering... He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So Hebrews is telling us, brethren, that Jesus fulfilled everything prescribed in the offerings for sin described in the Mosaic Law. He fulfilled the animal sacrifices. And he upheld the law by becoming the sacrifice for sin himself. If Jesus had not allowed himself to be the once for all offering for all mankind, then the single offering for sin that is stated in Psalms 40 before he walked the earth would have been an unfulfilled prophecy. So Jesus fulfilled prophecy in sacrificing himself for all mankind. Now the prophets of the Old Testament had announced a savior. It had been prophesied about his person, his mission, and many details of his birth, life, death, and resurrection, all of which Jesus fulfilled concerning what he would do as the Messiah and sacrificing himself. And the sacrifices of the law themselves foreshadowed his sacrifice for sin for all mankind. It was a foreshadow. Which only he could and did fulfill. And he did it once for all. So in addition to, to fulfilling or completing the law. By showing its spiritual intent and application. By exalting it. He also fulfilled or the completed the law in that the law required a sacrifice for sin, and he fulfilled that, thereby upholding the law 
as well as fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies about him in all respects. It's truly amazing, brethren. This is how Jesus fulfilled the law in its full glory. And it's very beautiful, is it not? He certainly did not end the law. And that's not what he meant by saying that he fulfilled it. And those that say that are not speaking the truth. And it is a critically important truth that we understand this. Because as I, as I said, there is a great deception coming. Well, let's go back to, pardon me, to Matthew chapter 5. And we'll look at the next verse in verse 18 in the account of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, this is his next statement concerning the law. He says, for assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And what does jot or tittle mean? It's like in, in writing when you have, you're crossing your T's and you're dotting your I's. He's saying that not one jot or tittle will pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So what does Jesus mean by this statement concerning the law? Jesus compared the continuance of God's law to the continuance of heaven and earth. He is saying that God's spiritual laws are immutable and indestructible. They can only be fulfilled, not abolished. Why? Because they're based on love. They're based on love. The Greek word translated as fulfilled in this verse, verse 18, is genome, G-I-N-O-M-A-I. And it means to come to pass, done, finished. So until the completion of God's plan to glorify humanity in his kingdom. Until that comes to pass, as long as there are fleshly human beings, the physical codification of God's law in scripture is necessary, every jot and tittle. This is as certain as the continuance of the universe itself. Again, Jesus is upholding the law. Now let's look at the third statement that Jesus makes here on the Sermon on the Mount in verse 19 here in Matthew 5. He said, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now this scripture can be somewhat difficult to understand. If we look at other scriptures, it is very clear that those who break the law that will not repent will not be in the kingdom of God because they will suffer the curse of the law, which is final death. So in our booklet, we actually add in parentheses by those. And let me read it to you with those by those added, which makes this verse a little clearer. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least by those in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great by those in the kingdom of heaven. Adding by those clarifies this verse. Because those that continue to break God's, God's law will not be in the kingdom of God. The Bible is very clear about that. So Jesus is saying that, that those who follow him have a continuing obligation to uphold and keep the commandments of God. He was certainly placing high regard upon the law that saying that those who keep it and teach it will be highly honored and those who break it and teach men to do so to break it will suffer the consequences of that. Once again, Jesus is upholding the law. Now let's look at the fourth statement here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. Jesus says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means 
enter the kingdom of God. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees were the most revered teachers of the law in their day. They were the interpreters of the law, and they were the experts in the law. The Pharisees were viewed as the most exemplary examples of the practice of Judaism in their day. They had established a code of rules and morals that were even more rigid than what was spelled out in the law of Moses itself. They had added all these things onto it. And they had based most of these practices, these things that they added on, on years of traditions. Both the scribes and Pharisees, they were both highly strict and they were highly respected by the people and they demanded that respect. But when Jesus says here on the Sermon on the Mount that one's righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, it must have been shocking to those that heard it. They're saying, how, how can this be? The Pharisees were looked up to as the very pinnacle of righteousness, a level much higher than the common man. But there was a serious problem with the scribes and Pharisees. They appeared to be, out, to be righteous outwardly, but broke God's law inwardly in their hearts. In Matthew 23, if you hold your place, but turn over to Matthew 23 with me. In verse 25 through 28. Matthew 23. Verse 25. Jesus was very direct. And he was very serious of what he said to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. He says, blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. This is a scathing rebuke, and it was deserved. Verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones in all uncleanliness. In verse 28, Even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside, in your heart, you are full of hypocrisy, and lawlessness. And what is lawlessness? The breaking of God's law. So they were not keeping the spiritual intent and application of God's law. And Jesus called them out on that. Notice what he says in verse 23. Just, I read the other part first. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and it and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So they were so tied into all these rigid things, going by the letter of the law, but inside they were filthy. And Jesus called them out on that. Because behind all of this outward show of righteousness was the motive of self-aggrandizement and self-interest. And they were serious problems of the heart. As Jesus said, the outside, the outside appearance of the cup was clean. But the inside, the intentions of the heart, was filthy. It was filthy. Again, Jesus is upholding the law. And he's upholding and magnifying it to the spiritual intent of it. But if we go back to Matthew chapter 5 and continue Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in verse 21. Hopefully you had a bookmark to hold it. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, 
you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So again, Jesus is bringing out the spiritual intent of the application of the law to not murder. And he's saying that anger, in feeding anger within yourself and allowing it to grow, that that anger which leads to murder is sin, that you sin in your mind. He's talking about the spiritual intent of God's law. And then in verse 27 and 28, which we read earlier, he talks about adultery and how keeping that in the spirit. You can appear to be righteous outwardly, but inwardly, inwardly, you can sin. So Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount these two examples of the spiritual intent and application of the law that the Pharisees sorely lacked. And we know that they were seething when they heard this because he rebuked them powerfully and it needed to be done. So Jesus was saying that God's law must be obeyed outwardly and, and it must be obeyed inwardly in the spirit and intent of the heart. This is how one's righteousness must exceed the outward appearance of righteousness of the Pharisees, which actually was not righteousness at all. Again, Jesus is upholding the law of God and he's bringing in the spiritual elements of the law that brings the law to its fullness, to the beauty of its completion. But before we leave the scribes and Pharisees, let's consider another concept that relates to them and the law. It is a concept that has been used to try to discredit obedience to God's law. It is the concept of legalism, of legalism. God's church has been accused of practicing it. I remember it clearly in, from 1995, but in other times as well. But is this true? Is it true? What exactly is legalism? Well, legalism by definition is a strict literal or excessive conformity to a law or to a religious or moral code. The word is frequently used negatively, especially against Sabbath keeping or obedience to other laws found in the Old Testament. But this use of the word is not correct. It is not legalism to obey God's laws correctly. It is legalism to misuse God's law in a way that was never intended. And the Pharisees were great examples of practicing legalism. They had added all sorts of humanly devised rules and regulations to the law, as I mentioned earlier. And this, in effect, placed a huge burden on people and it misused God's law. Because all of these man-made rules and regulations distorted the original purpose of God's laws and it rendered them ineffective. This mistaken view of the law led many at the time of Jesus to reject him as the Messiah because of legalism and because of what the, the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees had done to the law. Even though the law itself had foreshadowed and prophesied of Jesus. An example of this distortion of God's law is the, the Pharisees adding many man-made rules to the Sabbath. And I, I talked about those last year in a, in a message to you, about how they added all these rules, some of which were just plain silly. Like you couldn't walk on grass during the Sabbath because that was threshing. And if your house is on fire, you can only carry certain things out. You can only carry out what you're wearing, so you'd have to put on a bunch of clothes to save other clothes. You couldn't carry anything out. They made it so onerous that people probably didn't really like the Sabbath coming. It's like, oh, it's, it's so bad. 
they misuse God's law. And that's why Jesus called them out on it. That's why he said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Because of all those regulations, it's like man was like a slave to the Sabbath. And that's not what God intended. The Sabbath is a blessing and a time of joy and refreshment. Not to have all these regulations that make it so onerous that you don't even want to keep it anymore. And that's what was going on. That's why Jesus strongly condemned the legalism and hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. But there are additional facets of legalism. To try to earn one's salvation by keeping the law instead of having faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for our sins is legalism. No one can keep the law perfectly. We all need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in order to be forgiven upon repentance. In order for the curse of the law to be removed from over our head. Another facet of legalism is focusing on the obedience of the law apart from truly loving God and one's neighbor. In other words, focusing on the letter of the law and neglecting the spiritual intent and application of the law. And we saw this in the Pharisees as well. Technical obedience or strict obedience to the exact letter of the law while searching for ways to get around the law also ties into the neglect of the spiritual intent and application of the law. And it's another facet of legalism. And Jesus made this all very clear, brethren. Proper obedience to the law of God is not legalism. It's not. After conversion, a Christian is given a much fuller understanding of the purpose and intent of God's law. God opens our minds to see the spiritual aspects of it. In this person, God has called and given his spirit. He understands the importance of faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus' sacrifice for his sins. And he understands the importance of striving to obey God's law and repenting when he falls short. And he believes by his faith that he is forgiven because of Jesus Christ paying the penalty for his sin. And he understands that eternal life is a gift from God. One cannot earn it. No one can earn eternal life. It is a gift from God, as Romans 6.23 that we read earlier says. Obeying God's law, such as keeping the Sabbath and holy days, is not legalism. Don't fall for this clever trap and allow accusations of legalism to trouble you or to beguile you. It is not legalism to keep God's laws correctly, as we said. Well, let's briefly consider one more scripture that we read earlier that, that many say proves that Jesus changed the law of God. Matthew 13, verse 34, that we read earlier. Matthew 13, verse 34. It's not too far away from where we are now in Matthew 5. Matthew 13, oh, excuse me, what did I say? It's John 13, John 13, verse 34. Let's read it again. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. This is John chapter 13, verse 34. I'm sorry if I've misspoken. So Jesus is bringing in the element of love, and he's emphasizing it. And most of what Jesus said here in Matthew 13 is not new. Notice Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Let's turn over to, to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You shall not take any vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. God is 
speaking to the Israelites through Moses. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Jesus added some words that Moses could not say in his time here in Leviticus because the Savior had not yet come. Jesus added, as I have loved you. So as I mentioned, Jesus is bringing in and emphasizing the element of love into keeping the commandments of God. Love for God and love for neighbor. And that's what they are. That's what the law of God is, the Ten Commandments, to love. And Jesus set the standard because he loved us so much that he died for us, for all of us. That is the epitome of love. And he didn't just die, he suffered horrifically because he loved us so much. He said, you are to love others as I have loved you. Do we strive to do that? And I ask myself, how much do we strive to truly love others? How much do we ask God to help us to do so? Once again, Jesus is upholding the law, the spiritual intent and application of God's law to truly and deeply love God and others. And he showed that true and deep love for God and neighbor go hand in hand with obedience to God's law, which is the law of love. We're here in John. Notice John chapter 15, verse 10 through 13. Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. He says, love others as I have loved you and I lay down my life for you. And my commandment, this is part of him amplifying God's law of love to the spiritual intent and application of it. And you see, brethren, love and God's law are inseparable. And this is, again, one of the points that Jesus is making, that love and obedience to God's law are inseparable. And the law itself is a law of love. Well, some will still argue that the law of God in the Old Testament must be obsolete or we would have to do animal sacrifices. But God's law clearly shows that we saw today in Hebrews chapter 10 that Jesus came and sacrificed himself once for all, for all mankind throughout time. There is no need for additional sacrifices, which couldn't really take away sin anywhere. Anyway, they just foreshadowed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That was one of the things that he fulfilled, as we saw earlier. And some argue that the Old Testament specifies a physical temple. Where's the temple, the physical temple? God's word shows that true Christians are now the temple of God as the Father and Jesus Christ dwell in them by his Holy Spirit within us. Some still argue that the law demands circumcision, so it must be obsolete. But God's word also deals with this question as well. In Romans chapter 2, verse 25 through 29, Paul says your circumcision is that of the heart. That physical element of the law of Moses is not required. God is clear. Others argue that the food laws for unclean, clean and unclean meat are evidence of the God's law being obsolete in this modern age. But modern science, <clears throat> excuse me, still shows that clean and unclean, there is a scientific basis for it. They are for our own good and well-being, not to eat these foods that God did not design to be eaten. And he tells us this as the creator God. And it is one of the ways that we obey him. But it also gives us a blessing as we obey it, as does all of God's law. 
But there's yet another point in God's law that is a particular sticking point, and it is so because of Satan. And that is the fourth commandment. Because of Satan, the Sabbath and holy days have been looked upon as Jewish, and he has fermented all of this hatred toward the Jewish people, and this is one of the reasons. And the Sabbath is looked on the seventh day Sabbath with animosity because of Satan's influence. Satan is behind all of this because he knows that breaking the fourth commandment separates you from a relationship with God and from understanding and to be convicted of God's plan of salvation. And we see that in the world. They don't understand God's plan because they don't keep the Sabbath and holy days. Because you can lose the understanding, but you can lose the conviction of it. And you drift away from God. So to say that the Sabbath, the fourth commandment is done away with, is also wrong and it's diabolical. Because it destroys your relationship with God and blinds you. God's going to deal with that in due time. God's word clearly shows in the New Testament that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And that's in Hebrews 4, verse 9. We won't turn there. Why? Why is the fourth commandment still in effect? Because of its great value to all of mankind. And eventually all of mankind is going to realize it. But it's still in the future. And that value is on multiple levels. The value of the fourth commandment. But now let's go back to the, the scriptures that we read at the beginning of this message and the writings of Paul and look at them in the light of what we've seen today in God's word concerning the law. Romans chapter 6 verse 14. Let's go back and read it one more time. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What does Jesus mean? Or what does Paul mean by this? We are not under the curse of the law, which we've been clear, which we have seen clearly in God's word today. But notice the next verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, under the curse of the law, but under grace? Certainly not, he says. Paul clearly shows that we are not to continue in sin. And what is sin? It is the breaking of the law. If we are no longer under the law, as some say verse 14 states, then verse 15 makes no logical sense. So what does Paul mean in verse 14? As I said, we are no longer under the curse of the law, which is death that we saw in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, where Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. And we saw also today that Jesus paid the death penalty for all those who repent from their sins. So we're no longer under the death penalty when we truly repent of our sins in faith faith in Jesus who died for our personal sins. So Paul is saying that we are not to continue to sin as a way of life or in other words that sin shall not have dominion over us. We are to overcome sin with God's power the Holy Spirit within us. Clearly Paul is not saying the law has been abolished. Let's look at the next verse which wasn't far away in Romans chapter 7 verse 6. He says, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Paul is talking about deliverance from sinful passions, which are defined as sin by God's law. And he goes on to say that we are to serve in the newness of the spirit, not the oldness of the letter. This means we're to keep the spiritual intent in application of the law, as we talked about so much today, which is the fullness of the law of God, the law of love. And we do this as a new man, 
a person converted by the Spirit of God, which we also touched on. But notice what he says here in verse 7. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So Paul says the law is not sin. It defines sin. And there has to be a standard. And that standard is God's law. That standard is love. And Paul certainly does not say the law has been done away with or abolished. Let's look at the last scripture that I read earlier in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Galatians 3 verse 13. It says Jesus or Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And this scripture kind of answers itself, as you understand. Jesus became the curse of the law. He took that curse upon himself. Because the curse of the law is the death penalty, as we've seen today. And Jesus took that upon himself in our place. And the death penalty comes from the breaking of the law. But the law itself is not a curse. It is not a curse. In fact, in Romans 7, verse 12, which we won't turn there, but it says, Paul directly says, the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good. It's hardly something that he abolished or it even should be abolished. He did not abolish it. Brethren, before we leave the scripture about the curse of the law, let's consider why the breaking of the law brings the death penalty. Is God like this mean God that just looking for an excuse to just take you out? Is that God? That is not God. But there have to be consequences for sin. And here's why. It ties directly in to the incredible potential of mankind. God wants every human being who has ever lived to be in his divine family. And with his plan of salvation, that we're reminded of by one of his commandments, the fourth commandment every year, will give everyone that chance. And God wants every single person to be in his family. But to be given eternal life, to be part of his family, to be given power and glory like we can't even imagine right now that God is going to share with his children, but to have an attitude of continuing in sin and not repenting, to give a person to glorify a human being and make him immortal with that kind of power, with that kind of mind, would be another disaster, would it not? Look at what happened when Satan really led a third of the angels to rebel against God. Look at all of the destruction that has come from that and is still going on today and is going to go on in the future. It is going to peak before the return of Jesus Christ. To give a human being immoral life and that kind of power, but have that person still not repenting and having the mindset of continuing in sin would be disastrous. Even more disastrous than what happened with the angels. God will not allow that to happen because of what it would do not only to the person, but to all those others, all the others. The death penalty for sin, for human beings that will not repent is an act of mercy on God's part. That's why the law has the curse of the death penalty. And by God's grace, we won't be part of it if we seek to truly repent 
and to draw close to God. Well, brethren, in conclusion, I hope this message has been helpful to you. It was helpful for me to study it. I hope you are firmly rooted in the truth about God's law. That is, as it has not only not been done away with, but it has been exalted and it has been completed by the revealing of the spiritual side of the law. This was done by none, none other than Jesus Christ, who is I am. The one who actually gave the law to Moses. The law of God is a law of love. And God's law will not pass away because love will never pass away. Today, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for my sins and your sins and the sins of all humanity throughout time has come up multiple times. How his sacrifice took away the death penalty for those who would truly repent and make the gift of eternal life possible for mankind. How his sacrifice was foreshadowed in the Old Testament scriptures and by the animal sacrifices and how he fulfilled or completed the requirement of the law, a sacrifice of death for sin, thereby upholding the law. And I hope you will think about this tremendous sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me and for all humanity as we begin to enter our preparation for the coming Passover and Spring Holy Days. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath, a joyful part of the law of God, a blessing for all mankind.